Hello, and welcome to episode seven of Crisis, Christ, and Confidence. I'm Dr. Greg Poland, and I want to welcome each and every one of you dear believers who have faithfully encouraged and prayed for us as we have sought to bring calm in the midst of crisis and confidence in the midst of uncertainty by bringing forward Christ and Scripture into every aspect of how we think, act, and pray. Uh, I'm a professor of medicine and director of the Mayo Vaccine Research Group in Rochester, Minnesota, and more relevant to this series, one of the many uh, online students in the Masters of Arts and Theologic Studies. I'm joined by Dr. Dave Garner, the academic dean at Westminster Theologic Seminary and associate professor of systematic theology, and Dr. Peter Lilbeck, our president of WTS and church history scholar. Let me start with just a very brief update on COVID-19, as we have usually done. Uh, I think as all of you know, COVID-19 has now moved into the Southern Hemisphere, so we do want to keep our brothers and sisters in the Southern Hemisphere in prayer. And this is happening while we're still in the midst of it here in the Northern uh, Hemisphere. There are now almost 3.4 million cases known worldwide and about 237,000 deaths. But a bright spot has been the announcement yesterday of some improvement in those who have been infected and treated with an antiviral drug called remdesivir. And further progress is being made on a variety of vaccines. And plans are now slowly solidifying for how we might reopen safely. Well, for those of you that have been watching our series, I have the pleasure today of sort of turning the table, so to speak, and asking our distinguished faculty questions that tug at each of our hearts. The value is that, I think, of hearing how to approach and frame our most pressing questions and fears through the lens of God's Word. So among the most likely scenarios is that we're going to have a second wave of COVID-19 and as well as influenza outbreaks this coming fall and winter. Social distancing, isolation, job furloughs, and the fear of sickness and hospitalization has caused many to waver. Many are exhausted, mentally fatigued, and fearful, and we're even starting, unfortunately, to hear of sad cases where Physicians and nurses have taken their own lives. Others have run to bunkers and even other countries trying to outrun it. So this idea of fleeing, running away from wherever the virus is now, has always been a key feature of epidemics and pandemics. So what does the action of fleeing tell us about our beliefs? Who can flee and who can't? That is to say, are the conditions and the justifications different for different callings and stations in life. And to answer these questions, we're going to do what all committed believers do, and that is turn to Scripture and to the wisdom of God. So, Dr. Garner, can you help us think through a, a theology of fleeing versus saying, staying? In other words, from a, from a theological point of view, what can we say about the human desire to flee danger, and what does scripture say? And, and maybe even address, are the lessons different for doctors, nurses, and pastors? Well, first of all, Greg, it's, it's a lot of fun to see you wearing that host hat. So uh, thanks for doing that, and uh, glad to be doing this together with you and Pete again. So um, been very grateful for your leadership in this, so thank you. So a series of questions that you've laid out to us here you know, as you think about the motif of flight in Scripture, you actually don't have to go very far. Um, in Genesis 3, we find Adam and Eve having sinned, actually fleeing God. They're, they're trying to hide from him there. You see in the following chapter of the, the episode between Cain and Abel, um, there's a fleeing going on there. And throughout the Old Testament, we see the motif of fleeing. Perhaps one of the most... Uh, robust illustrations and portrayals of this is when the nation of Israel, having been released from Egypt, is now fleeing the Egyptian army. And you'll remember after they, they crossed the Red Sea on dry land, they are 
uh, beginning to panic because the Egyptian army is following after them. And we know how the Lord saved them as they had fled Egypt. You know, it is, it is interesting that that motif of, of fleeing and flight is actually tied to a very important idea in Scripture of the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of danger. It's a place of fright, uh, of a place actually of temptation. And as you think about Israel's experience, as they left Egypt having been redeemed, before they entered the promised land, they had to walk through the wilderness. And that place of wilderness was filled with all sorts of frightful experiences from which they wanted to flee. And yet it was God's purpose actually to take them through the wilderness. And we see in the, the books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, how the Israelites in the wilderness repeatedly failed. They fell into adultery. They fell into idolatry. They grumbled and complained. And as they were tested, they failed. And that wilderness motif of God's people failing actually is taken into the New Testament. One of the fascinating ways the New Testament looks at us as believers in this age it is that actually puts us in parallel to the old covenant people of God in the wilderness. In the, in the book of Hebrews, in chapters 3 and 4, that analogy is made explicit that the experience of Israel in the wilderness is actually parallel to our experience. How so? Well, you remember Israel was delivered from the Egyptians. The redemption that God had accomplished had indeed been accomplished, but they had not yet entered the promised land. They were in the wilderness. And the author of Hebrews tells us the same thing, that actually we've been redeemed. The, the, the work of Christ is completed. We're not yet in the new heavens and the new earth. And we are awaiting the blessing of that provision. In the meantime, guess where we are? We're in the wilderness. And it is in that wilderness context that we are called actually not to flee the danger, but to enjoy the promises and blessings of Christ in the face of the danger. More poignantly, I think it's important to note that the book of Hebrews actually points us in the wilderness to fix our eyes on Christ Jesus. Well, as you think about the ministry of Christ, one of the early episodes in the Gospels in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4 is the accounting of Jesus entering what? The wilderness. And he was actually led there by the Spirit. The text is explicit. God's purposes for Christ led him into the wilderness. And it isn't it interesting that as Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and was victorious over Satan's temptations in the wilderness, that guess who fled? After Jesus obeyed his Father, he experienced the blessing of the, the departure of Satan from him in the wilderness. So tying that all together, what is interesting both in Hebrews as well as in um, Paul's work of the, the book of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he tells the church to flee immorality. In chapter 10, also referencing the experience of the old covenant people of God in the wilderness, he says flee idolatry. Well, how do we do that? Well, we are reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ succeeded in the wilderness on our behalf. He is the one who is sympathizing with our weakness in the wilderness. And we're called to fix our eyes on him and to trust him. So as we think then about the wilderness experience, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're to flee evil, flee immorality, to flee idolatry. But not only are we called to flee, let me read for you a text from actually 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul writes to Timothy, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. And he's listed a whole host of things of idolatry and immorality. And then he says, instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, 
faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. If you read Paul carefully, you know when he says to fix your eyes on these traits of godliness, of righteousness, of faithfulness, of steadfastness. What he means is, fix your eye on Christ, who has done all those things for you. The Apostle James says, submit therefore to God, this is James chapter 4, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Isn't it interesting that we are given the promise that Satan will flee from us? Where? In the wilderness. How? By our dependence upon Christ who is all sufficient, who is the one who was victorious in the wilderness, who was the one who obeyed his Father and now, having been raised from the dead, is seated on the right hand of God the Father. And from there he lives forever to intercede for us. And he promises that he goes with us even to the end of the age. So, Greg, how should we think about flight? Um, well, I would suggest at the very least we should interpret flight this way. If we think that we can get away from danger, all we're actually doing in the context of a COVID-19 virus, if we think we should do all that we can to get away from it, we're going to flee from one danger to another because we live, as Scripture tells us, in this particular period of time in the wilderness. And it is there that Christ Jesus' adequacy is there for us. We are to fix our eyes on Him who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And as we ask the question, how should we think about the fright of COVID-19? Well, Scripture doesn't call us to flee. It calls us actually to pursue Christ. So as we even ask the question, what should I do about COVID-19? Well, our response to that question shouldn't be motivated by fear. It shouldn't be motivated by fright, but it should be actually motivated by the, the love of Christ that constrains us. So even as we ask the question, whatever our profession, the way in which we ask that question, our decision about flight shouldn't be grounded in fright, but actually in delight in Christ Jesus, who is the all-adequate Savior for us. The Apostle John tells us that perfect love casts out fear. Isn't it a wonderful blessing to know that by the power of Christ, we are actually given all that we need for life and godliness in the wilderness. So as we think about this moment in which we live, we actually can think about it very, very differently. To be reminded that we are in the wilderness. This is a place of danger, a place of temptation. But we're not left to our own devices. We are given the all-sufficient Christ and we are called to fix our eyes on Him, and He will not, as we've said in every episode, He will not disappoint us. We have everything that we need. So I think it's a good framework then for us to think about the question of flight, um, is to actually think about it through the lenses of the wilderness motif in Scripture, the success of Christ in the wilderness, and the provisions of Christ for His people in the wilderness. Yeah, Dave, that's wonderful. Boy, connecting all of those uh, points like that. In fact, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, and it may sound odd to some people, uh, but wilderness experiences can and often are a blessing in our lives, mm -hmm. aren't they? Yep, Particularly yep. in, our, in our, our path of sanctification. And that's a perfect segue. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Lilback, uh, as I mentioned, a scholar in church history. And we briefly touched on this in an earlier episode, but there is, in fact, a rich history of Reformed pastors and theologians uh, informed by their beliefs and convinced of God's absolute sovereignty who have stayed to minister in the midst of plagues and pandemics, mm -hmm. often at the cost of their own lives, e even sometimes the lives of, uh, of their families. Can you give us, uh, uh, Dr. Lilback, some insight as to on what basis these faithful pastors in ages past mm 
might have articulated or defended the basis upon which they chose to sit, stay. And this is particularly relevant because we are reviewing the lessons learned from 1918 influenza pandemic. And uh, I, I, it just strikes me that that would be a, a perfect way to think about this and broaden our theologic lens, if you will. Boy, those are great uh, questions. And uh, the context of living in the wilderness uh, in these contexts is when the wilderness shows its beastly power. <laughs> We're That's facing the wild enemy of, in this case, an invisible enemy of disease. And uh, it takes courage to stand and walk where God has called you to go. I think the, the let be, without going into specific historical examples first, let me go to the theology that was working in people's minds coming from Scripture when we think about these stories. First of all, one of the great uh, truths of the Old Testament is that we're to love God first, the first great commandment. The second one is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so the word neighbor is a very rich word. It means the people that are closest to us. And so when a disease of the magnitude we're talking about, a pandemic, a plague, a pestilence, whatever is coming, and people are in great need, the instinct of the heart is to flee and to protect oneself. And yet, if you're to love your neighbor, it means how do I leave them alone when they need someone? I'm able-bodied and they're not. So that great uh, ethic, the second great commandment, uh, remember Jesus said his entire uh, the law of God is built on these two great commandments. They're the two nails that hold up the, the commandments of God, loving God and loving your neighbor. So first there was that instinct, we have to care for those that are closest to us. It would be first, of course, our family, but then those that are in our communities. That was a very important principle. So uh, that social instinct of the Christian and Jewish tradition says, I have to care about my community, and Christians have done that. Now further, as Christianity unfolded, there was this sense of the great heroes of the faith. We use the word the martyrs of the faith, people who died because of their witness for Christ. The word martyr comes from the Greek word uh, meaning to witness. And every Christian in a certain sense is a martyr in that sense. We're to be witnessing the gospel. But there were a certain group of people who uh, so loved the Lord Jesus Christ that they witnessed for His glory with their very laying down of their lives. And that witness unto death for Christ meant that the word martyr became especially associated with those who sacrificed themselves for the good of others, just like the Lord did. He laid down His life for the salvation of others. And so we find early on in the Christian community a quest for martyrdom. It's interesting. And they actually had to be counseling that said, a Christian is not called intentionally to die. But if he's fulfilling his duties for the Lord and he gives his life, that is a godly calling. In other words, we don't pursue martyrdom in the sense of dying for our faith, but we ought to be willing to do that if Christ calls us there. And so I think, so the first principle is the love of neighbor. The second one is the love of Christ and witnessing for him. That means if someone needs to be cared for, I'm willing to lay down my life for them. And you can find that moving from the ancient church right up through the medieval period where some of the great Roman Catholic uh, ministries uh, to plague victims included the, the idea, we will not die at the hands of a political opponent. We'll die at the hands of an enemy loving our neighbors and we will be martyrs for Christ. And they long for that. That's amazing, but that is part of the tradition. Now there's another ethical principle that we understand, and that's Jesus' teaching of what we call the golden rule, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Jesus elevated all of the law by saying, okay, think about yourself. How do you want to be treated? Now take that same love, that agape love, and apply it to your neighbor. And all of a sudden that principle says, if I were alone dying by myself, and I, if someone would care for me and provide me food and water and shelter, I would want someone to come and help me. Well, then I should do that for that person. The great uh, principle of uh, the ethical implication of the uh, Good Samaritan suggests that idea of caring for one who is utterly helpless. It's an image of the gospel. Mm 
And then finally, the ethical understanding of the, of the uh, commandment that says, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, we understand that's the uh, uh, Eighth Commandment. Eighth Commandment, uh, excuse me, the Sixth Commandment. I apologize there. Thou shalt not kill. My old brain got confused for a moment. But the, the Sixth Commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. You put it in the positive form, which Luther and others argued for, said that means you should preserve life. So uh, we take a negative and we should turn it into a positive. So when it says uh, that you shall not covet, it means be content with what God has given you. Thou shalt not kill means preserve life. And so it is a general duty of the Christian taking the sixth commandment to look at someone who's facing death and saying, well, I didn't kill him, so I can run. No, to say, what should I do to preserve his life? And so out of that, then, everywhere through the history, through those principles I've summarized, wherever Christianity has gone, it has had a medical, hospital, compassion, uh, caring instinct. And so medical ministry, compassion care, counseling, crisis intervention, uh, helping uh, the widow, the orphan, the one who's exposed, it's all part of the gospel heritage. And so we can go through the ancient church, the medieval period, right up to the Reformation with Luther. We spoke about him. I think we've mentioned Spurgeon in another one. And we can look at now modern uh, medical missionaries going all around the world, risking their lives. Sometimes we have uh, pastors who go on medical trips. We have medical doctors, dentists going, nurses. Why do they do it? They're saying people need our care. And they realize that that sacrificial risk is an example of the love of Christ in action. I love you, but you know, someone loved us all more than I can ever have. My, my actions are shaped by Jesus. So you could tell a whole story of the Christian church just by going through pandemic, crisis, pestilence, plague, wars, and show how Christians have chosen to love in the face of the danger. That is to be active in the wilderness, as Dr. Garner has put it. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, it strikes me again that when we are faithful to that calling, uh, faithful to that witness, it is something that points to the better way, doesn't it? And, and draws people toward uh, Christ. Well, I want to read uh, just a brief bit of scripture and then uh, make one or two points and then ask uh, Dr. Garner to kind of wrap us up. This is a, a psalm dear to, I'm sure, all of us, Psalm 46, and we uh, likely have all profitably appealed to this during this time. And I'll read a few selected verses. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, even in the wilderness, right? Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We need only be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. Well, as we wrap up, I want to just personally say how immensely grateful I am to have co-labored with my, my brothers, uh, Dr. Garner and Dr. Lilbeck, in the midst of this crisis. It's been a great blessing to me. And I know I speak for all of us in hoping that our prayers have been answered for our listeners in helping bring the confidence in Christ into every aspect of our thinking and living through this pandemic together. So Dr. Garner, can I ask you to summarize as we close out this series, perhaps until uh, fall and then end us in prayer? Be delighted to, and let me also express my thanks to you, Greg, uh, and you, Pete, for, for doing this. It's been great joy and fruitful in my own heart as well, so sincere thanks. As we move to the, at least for now, the conclusion of Crisis, Christ, and Confidence, I just remind you some of the things that we've considered in these last several weeks. We've considered the issue of fear, we've considered the issue of divine judgment, we've considered the issue of conspiracy theory and 
perhaps the way in which that might have impacted certain people's thoughts about this. We've thought about compassion. We've thought about mercy. We've, we've talked about fatigue. And today we've talked about both flight and love. And what a wonderful way to end this session today and reflecting upon the, the, the love of God in, in Christ for us. Lord willing, we're going to be coming back in the fall to perhaps revisit some of these themes to consider what have we learned through these early months of this COVID crisis and how should we be thinking about it? And I actually think, Greg and Pete, we're going to look a little different next time we're on the program. Um, in fact, we might be, uh, maybe one could call us masked men, you know, we might hey, may look something like this. So, yeah, I don't know which of us makes, it, makes us look better in this, can you tell? Um, I, I, Dave, I don't think you're going to make it to medical school. I see your chin. You got to get it covered I'm up. Is that right? I was going to comment on that. Yeah. Well, maybe I don't know how. To, Greg, is this better? Hey, how there, am I doing? there you go. Okay. There you got it. Now it's not over my pug nose. I'm not sure it'll work. Now, now, once once we have the mask on, we never touch the face of the mask again. Well, that, I'm already guilty. I'm going to take it off so that I can pray. So again, thank you, brothers. Let's close in prayer and then look, Lord willing, to another episode in the fall. Let's pray together. Father, it is indeed uh, a great joy to reflect on your word and its truthfulness for us in seasons of great distress. We thank you, O oh God, that you have counted us worthy as your children to walk through a new pathway of wilderness and its dangers. And I want to thank you for the love of Christ that has been manifest in the wilderness, through the wilderness, and now He, by His Spirit, meets every one of our needs in our wilderness experience. So I pray that as we think about this virus and its impact financially, health-wise, culturally, that we would fix our eyes on Christ and that we would indeed delight in Him and enjoy the abundant provisions of His life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. So, oh God, forgive us for our fears. May we instead fear you and enjoy the great love of Christ and its impact and import for us today, tomorrow, and indeed forever. We pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, to our friends, as we close this session, we want to remind you that in the winds of corona chaos, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our anchor. Hold fast to your confession of Christ, you will not be disappointed.